I want to talk to you this morning about one of my passions, uh, cities, how they evolve and how um, the decisions we make affect their evolution. In 1949, E.B. White wrote a book called Here is New York. And in just 52 pages, he describes the city in all its raw glory. He talks about how he's affected by the history that emanates from the city, how the fact that where he writes this book, he's just five blocks away from where Nathan Hale was executed eight blocks away from Ernest Hemingway's uh, publisher's office, and how across the river in Brooklyn, Walt Whitman uh, sweated out editorials. To me, he talks about the essence of all cities, not just New York, um, their evolution, how all these layers of history interact together, each one having their own importance, and each one having effect on life today, as well as the, that city's evolution. Even here in Cleveland, we can talk about how in this very theater, we're all sitting in seats where this neighborhood saw many a silent film. Or over in downtown in an alley off of East 8th Street, uh, Chef Boyer D opened up his original restaurant before he made, went and made fame and fortune in SpaghettiOs. Um, and across town in University Circle, uh, industrial design great Victor Schreckengoss attended art school and then he returned several years later to open up the, the um, industrial design department in the Cleveland Institute of Art. What I'm really fascinated by is the decisions and how all these layers interact and the decisions that we make that lead places like Cleveland, this is an image of Warehouse District in about the turn of the 20th century, and, and other cities just like it, what, lead, what are those decisions that lead to their evolution? How do we go from a vibrant commercial core like this to here? This is the, where it's the Warehouse District today. So it's hard to believe I'm telling you a success story when you look at a picture like this. But somewhere down the line, a property owner made a decision that this property is more valuable as, as a parking lot and didn't think about the building in, in terms of its sense of community and what, it, what its place in the evolution of the neighborhood is. Obviously, a lot of questions of this are answered in the, the evolution of America's economy and, and post-war, post-industrial um, priorities. But really, the idea of a value is really what of individual properties really comes into play. Consider if these property owners thought about this in a different way and thought about what these buildings mean to the community today and what its opportunity are is to, to sustain an evolution going beyond that. I want to offer you two illustrations in the, in the city of Cleveland um, that, that, that talk about how uh, long-term value and community played key roles in the decisions that were made about that area. These are four buildings in the warehouse district of the late 70s, early 80s. And you know, when you look at these pictures, it's hard to believe that anybody saw saw value um, in these buildings, let alone a collection of buildings in this condition. As the, um, the Justice Center was built and some other offices on the edge of the, of the neighborhood, it was easy to, it's kind of easy to see how a lot of property owners said, wait, wait, I don't know what to do with this building, but I think parking is a good option here. But this is also the beginning of the story of the revitalization of this neighborhood. It's a typical grassroots historic preservation story where a group of uh, architects and designers um, advocated against the indiscriminate demolition that was occurring at the time. These are those buildings today. Those people at the time saw value in those buildings. Now, I, I suppose there's an appreciation of history and architecture plays a, a, a vital role in this. It's, it's kind of the, the impetus of all this. But none of this happens without historic preservation and the tools it provides. Historic tax credits, historic conservation easements, the, uh, the use of the alternative building code of, for older buildings. These are the tools that make the redevelopment happen and it also creates the opportunity for these communities to sustain the revolution. But I want to dig a little bit deeper here. Um, in the 80s, when the, the, the previous picture where I showed you, um, there were six occupied buildings and 55 vacant buildings. Um, so in, uh, some um, incremental development occurred over, over 20 years or so with the guidance of a master plan. And today, only two buildings are vacant. So this, what, what we've seen here is $500 million of investment, where 3,000 people today call the warehouse district home. Another 3,000 people come here to work every day. And probably on a weekly basis, around 20,000 people come to enjoy the commercial business. There are probably about 50 commercial businesses in, in, the, in the district that include an independent grocer at Costantino's, a local coffee shop, our own Phoenix Coffee, who's providing coffee here today, and other great award-winning restaurants and nightclubs. 
So what this really is, is a story of a, of a group of buildings that were derelict, and now we have a place. But when you think about it a little deeper, what happened was where you took a collection of buildings that were underutilized, generating almost no revenue into the city's economy, and you provide jobs by renovating those buildings and the construction jobs, and then you fill those buildings with businesses and residents and office workers, and all of a sudden you have a sustained revenue of, of money into the local economy generated from the, the commercial and in, um, income taxes. <clears throat> now I want to circle back really quick to the parking lots and the, the value of that parking lot versus um, the value if, if you consider um, saving those buildings. Um, this is Bridgeview Apartments in the Bingham Building, former warehouse buildings. Um, that are now renovated as mixed-use residential buildings, 340, 250 um, units of housing, uh, respectively. They're both today 90% occupied, and they provide parking for all the tenants. The Pinnacle is built on top of a 1970s parking garage, 80 units of condominiums, valued at 300,000 to over a million dollars. And the parking garage provides parking for those residents, as well as some of the residents in the, in the neighboring buildings that you see in that image and, a, um, and a, uh, a major office tenant nearby as well. So which one do you think has more value in the community? Which one's generating more revenue in the, in the local economy? Speaking of parking lots, the story of the historic gateway neighborhood is a story that begins with parking lots. A decision was already made about the value of that place. This is the Share Street Market, later known as the Central Market. This is what the Gateway Sports Complex replaces. But unfortunately, a decision was made to locate the highway just south of this um, market, which decimated the neighborhood around it and led to the decline of the market. So really, the story about Gateway is, how do we recreate a place as we knit the community back together? When the Gateway Sports Complex was being planned in the early 90s, three major decisions were made. Locate the, the um, sports complex to the uh, southern end of the district, preserve north-south connections with, uh, for pedestrians and traffic, and to limit the number of parking spaces they built in, in the structured parking, distributing parking throughout the area. There was also a uh, historic structures um, report done that identified all the historic buildings in that area that were eligible for all the historic preservation tools that were already being used successfully in the warehouse district. So when you put all this together, you have an economic development strategy that creates a market for all these buildings around Gateway to be developed and a tool to finance them. So when developers and property owners thought about developing these buildings in the Gateway neighborhood, the idea of it was a lot less daunting. So today, these are those buildings today, and you represent about $600 million in development, about 1,500 residents there today, five hotels, four of which are in historic um, buildings, and uh, over 60 businesses. And what's interesting about this is that the sports complex is what leveraged all this development. But because of the success of the development with the housing and the commercial, the, um, the investment and in, in other entertainment um, destinations, this is a place that's a destination under itself. So they no longer solely Re, um, rely on the sports complex for, to, to, to drive business and sustain themselves. And what I really love about the story is that you can really kind of, um, you can almost really watch the evolution occur. Fourth Street is actually the, the, the best example or way to illustrate it. Started off, as I'm told, as a resident, a tree line residential street. And then in the late 1800s, um, it was the beginning of, of Cleveland's first, inter, uh, first entertainment district. Uh, on the left is the, the construction of the Euclid Avenue Opera House. But if you look in the background, you can see one lonely little house. So even in this picture, is evidence of the evolution of this place. Later in the, in, the, in the 20th century, it turned into a commercial district with discount department stores. So these pictures are actually the same geographic corner of the corner of East 4th Street and Euclid. Today, East 4th Street is a thriving uh, entertainment district with a, with a house of blues, a comedy club, great restaurants like the Greenhouse Tavern, and housing above. And what I really love about the story when I'm looking at the evolution of, of, of all these neighborhoods that I'm involved in is that the story is never over. Only the question about how this will evolve. Now, 
I find it hard, and I think a lot of you probably find it hard to, to imagine what would happen if we actually saved these buildings, like the, blocks, um, the Blackstone and Power Block that was on Frankfurt um, in the warehouse district. But what's important, I think, to do is to think about um, the lessons we learned, the buildings we lost, the buildings we saved, what the sense of place they have, the sense of history, the culture that we have, and use that energy into, into our decisions as we um, make decisions about revitalizing our neighborhood. What are we gonna do about these buildings? This is the Stanley Block, the oldest building in downtown and the Columbia Building on the corner of Prospect in, in Ontario. These buildings are being discussed as we speak. Will we demolish them? Making room for a parking structure for the, the proposed casino? Or will we think about these buildings in the context of the greater whole, the greater community, and develop a strategy that works with them holistically and continue the economic development and planning strategy of the Gateway Sports Complex? Because these are actually within that, within that area. Or will we look at the major investments as a way to leverage the marketability of these areas and really create a mechanism that sustains their evolution in time? The places we preserve are great on many levels. They ground us in our, our rich cultural heritage. They give us a sense of place. And more than anything, they build community. So the decisions we make individually and collectively as a community will determine the success of our cities. I believe that we owe it to ourselves to see the value in these buildings beyond today and create a means for our communities to evolve and thereby sustain themselves. And now I want to leave you with a little bit more of E.B. White. He ends his book with a passage about an old willow tree in the interior garden in Turtle Bay. He speaks about this tree as a symbol for cities, life under difficulties, growth against odds, in the midst of concrete. And then he speaks about its significance to the city. The fact to him, this particular tree must be saved. If it were to go, all would go. The city, this mischievous and marvelous monument, to not look upon would be like death. Thank you.